Okay, everybody, welcome back to the podcast, Philosophy for the People. We are joined once again by Dr. Kenneth Pierce, who has been on the show before. We discussed um, his uh, debate book, excellent book. I've recommended it many times where he's in dialogue with Dr. Graham Oppie, and there's a lot of a lot of really cool thought in that book, and we got to explore a little bit of Dr. Pierce's uh, spin, if you will, on the argument from contingency, uh, which he positions in the context of grounding, which we'll explore here. And this conversation, uh, we'll, we'll hit on that a little bit, at least I'd like to. Uh, but we're also going to talk about, um, I guess, an extension of that project, and that is how we can make sense of contingency in relation to foundational grounding and classical theism, uh, which I think most classical theists sort of want to do. It's a classic problem, I guess, of how do you get how do you get contingency from necessity, right? Is, is that how you, how would you summarize this simply for people, <laughs> what the problem is here, Dr. Pierce? And, and thanks for coming back, by the way. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me again. Um, yeah, so I'd say this is the, the general problem is how do you have an ultimate explanation of everything mm -hmm. while still allowing that some things could be different from how they are? Uh, and it's often been thought that theism has a, a kind of special advantage there. Um, and I've said this as well, that uh, free and rational choice is a type of explanation. It can be explained in terms of the agent's reasons mm -hmm. that allows you to have full explanation without, um, get, without necessitating the outcome, right? There are still alternatives that are possible. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is a little bit difficult to see quite how that's going to work for a necessary being who has all attributes necessarily. And in particular, people have thought that the fact that God is necessarily perfectly good, necessarily perfectly rational, and so on, would prevent um, us from kind of getting the contingency that classical theism claims to preserve. In which case, you know, he might not have the, the sort of ultimate explanation that we were promised. And so that's the sort of thing that I kind of, um, I guess I'd say that's something that was uh, covered not sufficiently thoroughly in some of my previous work. And I'm trying to fill in the details a little better now. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can't do everything at once, right? It's always got to be, it's always got to be a development. Sometimes people expect you to though, which is a little bit weird. Right. Well, you didn't cover this one thing. Well, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I might have more to say about that. So, okay. So this is a, this is a classic problem that I guess comes in different flavors. Uh, as we know, the, the sort of issue, the general issue of modal collapse is all the rage right now in the, right. in the kind of wider discussion. And it does sort of come down to the idea of, well, Contingency just seems obvious. It seems like most people just, you know, are like, yeah, that just that just like seems like we have to account for contingency. Uh, and it seems like necessity at the bottom is maybe needed to give some sort of explanation of why there's anything contingent. But how do we get from the necessary to the contingent without everything becoming necessary? <laughs> right. That's a, that's sort of that's sort of the issue I said on. a So I think you can do that. But I did say on a recent podcast, like if if I were forced to give up something in the debate and say like there was a modal collapse argument and, and I just didn't know how to deal with it. I think I would sooner give up contingency than I would classical theism though. I think I would just sooner just be like a necessitarian. I don't know. What, what are your intuitions but, on that? Right. No, I mean, I'm, I'm inclined to agree at least, at least when we're asking this question of, um, you know, what kind of contingency are we looking for? Mm-hmm. So I really like uh, it, Robert Adams' book on Leibniz, right? People worry about Leibniz having this modal collapse problem. Right. And Adams says, we need to be careful about what Leibniz actually cares about in his dispute with Spinoza mm -hmm. and what he thinks is important, right? And according to Adams, what's really important to Leibniz is teleology, that is, that things happen for reasons, that there's a goal toward which things in the universe are directed. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Leibniz doesn't need necessarily contingency in our sense to, to get that, right? Even if it's a necessitating explanation, what kind of necessitation is it? Is it a necessitation that is because of goals or ends or goodness? Mm -hmm. Right. Or is it, as Spinoza says, just the necessity of the divine nature? 
And we get a similar idea in some classical Islamic philosophers who, uh, you know, Al-Ghazali and some other thinkers accuse these folks of being necessitarians um, and of not preserving the right kind of divine freedom. Mm -hmm. But uh, Ibn Sina says, you know, what, what is it to be perfectly ideally free and perfectly ideally good? At one point, he says that for a perfect being, there is no difference between knowing something to be best and choosing it, right? And this, of course, fits in with Ibn Sina is the big divine simplicity guy, the, the kind of original divine simplicity guy that Aquinas right. and all that stuff from. Mm -hmm. And so what's, you know, so what's going on there is it's actually an imperfection in us that our will is different from our knowledge. Mm hmm right and so we can know the good and not choose it because mm -hmm. our will and our knowledge are different and god wouldn't be like that mm -hmm. and but what's crucially different from somebody like spinoza there right is that it's all about the good that god's knowledge of the good is what explains why this world is actual rather than a different one right um and and yeah i think I think the necessitarianism or quasi necessitarianism or weak notion of contingency, mm -hmm. I think there are some problems with that. And I've kind of presented some arguments for why I think we need contingency. Um, but I don't think any of that's as big a problem as just how hard it is to swallow the idea that this is the best of all possible worlds. <laughs> right. Right. Uh. <laughs> and if, and if I could swallow that, I'd get a lot less worried about the, the contingency stuff. I guess. Yeah. And there's also the, you know, the distinction to be made about um, even if we were in a, in a necessitarian framework, uh, the entities themselves are still presumably contingent as and they're, they're still hanging upon, right? That's the sort of original notion of contingency right. that is still is dependent upon. So yeah, it had to have happened, but it's still not a being that is necessary through itself. So we still have a right. notion of contingency in these. Right. And so, you know, um, I mean, Sina is a bit puzzling when you read him as an analytic philosopher, when, when you've kind of been trained in the analytic tradition, because mm. his uh, discussion of contingent objects, right, start out, starts out by saying, whatever's not necessary in itself is necessitated by something else. Right. Yeah. Right. I just read the Ca Cambridge element on him that I thought was pretty good uh, that helped clarify okay. some of this for me a little bit because I'm with yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But right. So what he's thinking really is a distinction between intrinsic necessity and extrinsic necessity. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, Michael Griffin kind of reads Spinoza and Leibniz that way as well mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. that that's really what's going on for them. Even when you might think that Leibniz is aiming for uh, a more robust notion of contingency than that. Right. Yeah. So where do you think? Um, <clears throat> uh, so it seems to me that Aquinas kind of wants wants all of it. If we're, if we're thinking about Aquinas's view is that uh, I mean, he does make distinctions between beings that are um, necessary through another and, and necessary in themselves. Right. Uh, but he also seems to to want to say that the world is 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 not necessitated either. Right. Um is that the is that the position you fall broadly in line with, and that you're you're trying to develop and, and argue for in your uh, yeah work now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, and I think for uh, you know for a lot of these medieval philosophers, including Al Ghazali and including Aquinas, mm -hmm. the worry is really fundamentally a worry about divine freedom. Mm -hmm. um, that that they take it to be kind of a point of orthodoxy in, in Islam and in Christianity, respectively, that God is free to choose how God wants the world to be. And in fact, free not to create at all, according to Aquinas. That's a major point for him. Yeah. Um, I think today we have kind of a different set of concerns about contingency. Some people are still really concerned about the divine freedom thing. I have some sympathies with compatibilism as does Leibniz. And so I'm not uh, necessarily, so I don't necessarily think that divine freedom 
by itself obviously gets a really robust notion of contingency. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we have some other concerns that you don't often find in those medieval sources. One is just the uh, the kind of intuition about what could have been otherwise mm -hmm. and how we're going to explain that intuition. Uh, another is the distinction, kind of the concept of laws of nature and the distinction between uh, lawful generalizations, law-like generalizations, and accidental generalizations. Um, and then there are some specific things in current physics that leads us to believe that some things are physically contingent. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of on standard views, physical contingency is going to imply metaphysical contingency. Mm -hmm. And so we, I think we kind of need in our view of the world as we understand it today, uh, some significant notion of contingency where we're going to distinguish between what is, um, you know, what had to be that way and what could have been different. Right. And that distinction is part, partly practical. It plays mm -hmm. a role in engineering, for instance. Um, sure. That is, if you can show that something violates the laws of nature, a, pr a proposed task violates the laws of nature, then you know not to spend your time trying to accomplish it. Right. Right. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we need something that's going to make sense of, of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So really good. And I guess uh, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but you, you brought up some, uh, you know, sort of concerning modal intuitions. I do want to pursue this a little bit, right? Because yeah, um, it seems like um, however many ergs of energy there are in our universe, there could have been one more, right? Right. But it seems like some views of modality, and I think a dialogue partner of yours might hold this type of view, would say, that might not actually be the case, <laughs> right? Um, so how do you how do you like to sort sort through that, right? Do you, you know is it is it is it is it enough to just say, well, okay, your your position just has a really big cost to modal intuitions, and that's the most we can say against it? I think I would want to say more against it, but yeah, t talk to us about modal intuitions. I just like to hear your perspective yeah. on it, and yeah, so. So I think our modal intuitions are, I, I don't, I try not to put too much weight on intuition as such. I think that's safe. Um, right? <laughs> yeah. But I think our modal intuitions are kind of at their most forceful mm -hmm. um, when they have these practical implications. Mm -hmm. Right. So like um, I could have sat down three inches to my right Um that's a possible scenario, a possible way the world could be. I think that sort of thing, because like <laughs> I need to, uh, you know, at that moment when I was sitting down on this couch, I could have decided to sit three inches to the right. I couldn't have decided to uh, sit on a planet in the Alpha Centauri system, um, right? Because that violates the laws of physics. It's not just technologically impossible. It's physically impossible for me to get there that fast. Mm -hmm. um and so those sorts of things where they're kind of guiding our practical actions i think we need to put significant weight on there's a question about what the correct metaphysical interpretation of those facts is mm -hmm. i don't think we need to kind of take them at face value for doing metaphysics but we need to take them seriously somehow i would put greater weight on um arguments from scientific practice and from uh, our best current physics. And this is something I, I push on in the debate with Oppie. Mm -hmm. um, that I think, you know, if you look at the science, and not everybody agrees with this. So John Divers, for instance, argues that uh, modality doesn't really have a role in science. But this is a pretty non straightforward interpretation that doesn't take very seriously. Um, kind of what scientists say when they try to explain the theories in plain language. Yeah. Um, so if you think that kind of interpreting the theories in plain language is also part of the scientific expertise that we philosophers should defer to, and it's not just the math or whatever, mm -hmm. um, they say things all the time about kind of what could have been or would have been, how things would have been different if this or that changed, what is and isn't allowed by the laws of physics. Right. 
And one of my favorite examples for this kind of stuff is um, there's this great book. It's a little dated now. Uh, Bangs, Crunches, Whimpers, and Shrieks by John Earman. Don't you love books with titles like that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's about, it's kind of a history and philosophy of science work that is about the debates about weird solutions to the equations of general relativity, right? So including solutions that permit time travel mm -hmm. and all kinds of other wild stuff like that, right? And one of the things that goes on in these historical debates is that both physicists and philosophers of physics have these disputes about which solutions are physical. That's the term the, the physicists use. Yeah. Or have physical significance. Mm -hmm. And it's clear that they don't mean by that which solutions are actually instantiated in our universe. Mm -hmm. Right? They mean something else. And the most straightforward interpretation of what they mean is, you know, which ones are actually physical possibilities and which ones are like weird mathematical artifacts. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and when they're debating that, they're assuming that these that non-pathological solutions, <laughs> right? Solutions that don't have wormholes or time travel or weird stuff like that yep. are physical. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of non-pathological solutions that don't seem to be actual. Mm -hmm. um, our universe is pretty well behaved. Mm -hmm. um, and so it sure looks like there's a kind of presupposition in the practice of physics um, and other sciences that things could have been otherwise than they are. Mm -hmm. And once again, I don't think we should always read the metaphysics off of that in a simplistic way, mm -hmm. but I also think we need to take it seriously and explain it. So yeah. we need a, a distinction between basically that the physically possible is wider than the physically actual. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it needs to be wider in a particular way. And then we need an account of what physical possibility amounts to. Right. Uh huh. What do you um, so uh, th that's great. Thank you, by the way. And I really enjoyed that that section in the in the book, in your dialogue with uh, Dr. Oppie. I thought it was just a, a, a series of good points. Um, you were recently in conversation with a friend of mine, good friend of mine, Josh Rasmussen, which I was very excited about because I enjoy both of your work. He's got this principle of modal continuity, which uh, he likes to use to um, kind of run his sort of contingency argument, right? He wants to say, look, if the, the number of ergs in uh, our universe is, is po possible, which it is because it's actual, then one more is possible because there's nothing relevantly different, right? Right. About about that that one more. And then he sort of uses this principle to say, to give us a, a, a greater explanatory principle of shaving away all arbitrary limits, which he talks about, right? And then he thinks that once you have that principle in hand, you can kind of drive to classical theism, more right. or less, right? What are your thoughts on 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 all of that? <laughs> yeah, so so I might, um, I think the the methodological approach that Josh takes perhaps puts a heavier weight on intuition yeah. than I would like to. But I think you can get to similar results uh, without putting so much weight on on intuition. Right. And one way you can do that is just to talk about the simplicity of theories or worldviews. Mm -hmm. So when you've got kind of arbitrary stuff in there, uh, what a physicist would call fine tuning, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're trying to say it's a law that there are that there's exactly so much energy in the universe. That's just a fundamental fact in order to get our universe. That's a kind of, um, and, and nothing else is possible. The laws of physics or metaphysics require that exact amount. Yeah. That's a kind of arbitrary sort of fine tuning thing. It's the kind of thing we would like to get rid of because it makes our theory complex and messy. Mm -hmm. And so if we could have, if we could like not put that in there by fiat, uh, in an ad hoc way and instead have some more coherent theory, right. uh, that would be preferable. So I have to talk about this now because this is obviously relevant uh, to the larger debate, the virtue of simplicity. And I think I'm pretty much on the same page that you are right now, but I, I want to get some clarity about it because simplicity, 
ironically is complicated, right? <laughs> Whether divine simplicity or theor theoretical simplicity, and there's different kind of flavors of simplicity people like to talk about, quantitative, qualitative, uh, conceptual, or even Michael Humer talks about adjustable. It's about all about the adjustable parameters, right? Which you're, right. you're, you're talking about, right? And maybe that could be reduced to one of the other uh, ideas of simplicity. However, Humer, Humer thinks it's like super overrated. Humor mm -hmm. is like skeptical of it. He's like, even in science, it's not that big of a, you know, this um, decision maker, deciding factor. But then he's even more skeptical when it comes to philosophy. He thinks like its mm -hmm. application of philosophy is, is, is um, merits more skepticism. I don't know if you've read humor on his, his account of that at all, but I guess I, I just want your theory of simplicity where, where does simplicity matter most? Why does it matter? Why should we think that simplicity is a reliable guide to truth? I guess is the thing we're, we're trying to hunt down here. And uh, I kind of know where you're going to go because I've, I've read your work on this too, but I want it for the audience. It'd be nice to have you um, spell that out a little bit if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, following Graham Oppie, actually, um, you know, I, we, I distinguish three kinds of simplicity. There's kind of simplicity in how much stuff you're positing mm -hmm. um, simplicity in how many and how complicated concepts you need to express the theory. And then simplicity in the kind of number of basic unexplained statements mm -hmm. needed to uh, express the theory. Um, and in terms of why that's a guide to truth, um, I mean, I don't know that I have a, a definite argument for it. I'm going to, there are obviously track record arguments in science, which I do think, you know, I disagree with humor on this point. I do think it plays a significant role in the theoretical sciences and guiding inquiry. Um, a difference between science and philosophy is that in the sciences, typically these sorts of theoretical virtues uh, guide decisions about which theories to make, to take most seriously mm -hmm. and to try to test. Uh, but the theories get tested. Mm -hmm. um, notoriously, the experiments always underdetermine the the theories, right? So there are always, and usually simplicity is part of the explanation of why, like, look, I've got this weird jerry-rigged jerry theory that explains all the data or predicts all the data just as well as the one the scientists are actually taking seriously. Mm -hmm. And why aren't they taking that one seriously? Well, because it's weird and jerry-rigged, right? Mm -hmm. Um so there, but there is this kind of experimental testing. Um, and the nearest analogy you can get to that in philosophy, which does also sometimes occur in um, highly theoretical sciences like cosmology, mm -hmm. um, is kind of when you work out the details of the theory, um, does it predict a universe that looks anything remotely like ours or not? Mm -hmm. um, so, so you can do that, right? And also similarly, kind of the things we take to be basic facts, are they, how compatible are they with the theory? How neatly do they fall out of the theory? Um, so that's similar to kind of the things that happen at the theoretical frontiers of, of the sciences, but it's not similar to the kind of um, clean cases that we really like in the sciences where you have a really nice experiment that kind of decides the matter. Right. Um, and in that way, I think that, I mean, I like Tim Maudlin's view that we can see philosophy as um, not not being science, mm -hmm. right, but being somehow continuous with science, that if we kind of go further out into the theoretical frontiers that get further and further away from concrete experiments, yeah. we just shade over from science into philosophy imperceptibly without there being any kind of sharp line. Okay. Yeah. All right. That brings up one more other thing I wanted to touch before we get to the the heart of this, this conversation. I promise we'll get there, gentle listeners, but this is it's, it's so much fun to pick Dr. Pierce's brain about these other things. Uh, and this is another point that came up in your conversation with, uh, with Dr. Rasmussen. I'll uh, encourage people to go check that out. That was on the channel, uh, Capturing uh, Christianity. A really good, fruitful conversation. And, uh, 
And I really liked your response to this. So I want, I want to expand upon it. And it was when Josh essentially asked if you thought that theism was compatible with naturalism. Right. right. And I'm so with you, Dr. Pierce. I mean, it seems to me that like the most interesting thing about naturalism, because I came from a naturalistic perspective was that it's sort of motivated by a broad scientism mm -hmm. and that scientism sort of constrains the naturalist ontology. Um, and I, yeah, I guess you, you, you could widen that, be liberal with that ontology. Right. But to me, that just seems to be to lose a lot of motivation of what makes naturalism so interesting in the first place. Right. right. So I, I don't want to like be like super forceful and say like a naturalist must have an ontology that's constrained by science rocks. Right. <laughs> but at the same time, I think they kind of should. <laughs> I don't know. What are your, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah. And maybe well, you can better say what I'm trying to say here. And then. Yeah. So I mean, scientism is kind of a pejorative term, you know, but I do think that something that, that theists and naturalists and everybody should accept is that uh, science has been a really successful enterprise, right? Mm -hmm. Right. For understanding things and building better machines and, and so on and so forth. And we should have a lot of respect for it. And um, naturalism, like a lot of isms is uh, kind of vague and perhaps best expressed in slogan terms or something. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I would think that the kind of attractive slogan is don't go beyond the science. Yeah. And then there's a question of uh, what we should actually mean by that or how we should understand it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm perfectly happy to let particular naturalists spell that out in their own way. I, I don't think there's kind of an, an essence of naturalism that we can say automatically that people are unnaturalistic for doing this, that or the other. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that... Um, yeah, that when naturalism starts, when people who purport to be naturalists start allowing, um, you know, philosophical uh, speculation or, or metaphysical stuff that goes way beyond the science, um, they kind of lose the attraction of naturalism as such. That's, right? I agree. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of other, there are lots of views that take science really seriously, including the best versions of theism. Mm -hmm. um, there are also lots of non-theistic views, mm -hmm. right? It's not like naturalism and theism are the Form only- Form of partition, yeah, they group, don't. Mm -hmm. Right? But if what you're trying to do is, like if naturalism is the motivation, and if you're trying to reject theism because of naturalism and not some mm -hmm. other reason, right? Then if you start introducing stuff that, that goes beyond the science and you're not just sticking really close to the science. Um, I think you kind of lose the motivation, but of right. course you might have some other motivation for atheism that isn't. The, right. Maybe it's a problem of evil or something like that. Yeah. Right. And of course not all atheists are naturalists either. Right. Yeah. So we're, we're in agreement there. I, I guess I just, the, a few other uh, points on, on that point is um <laughs> Well, I do like Oppie's kind of, op but the thing is naturalists don't agree on this, right? So, 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 so when I read Oppie, he, he seems to have a nice set of criteria. Like if you want to be called a naturalist, you have to say all causes are natural causes. Mind is late and local. Nothing is divine, right? right. If you don't meet that criteria, you're not a naturalist. But I know many naturalists say I am a naturalist and I don't meet that criteria, right? I'm a cosmopsychist, right? And, um, right, right. Then I don't know what to do. <laughs> it's like, how do we, right? We're, I mean, I guess they're just so they're such different paradigms, right? And then then the term naturalism just becomes increasingly unhelpful, right? And it's and it's it's widened out like that. Um, so that's why when I always have conversations about naturalism, I say, I'm thinking of a worldview that is guided by a broad scientism, not trying to use it pejoratively, that constrains the ontology and it's attractive because science rocks like that's what that's what it really has going for it right right and and that again is a lot of these isms you kind of you start from some slogan or something yeah and then every philosopher is going to develop it differently and mm -hmm. i do think some panpsychists um make let's say a plausible case or a reasonable case where you can understand what they're doing at least mm -hmm. when they try to say that their panpsychism is naturalistic because you're thinking things like um uniformity is a principle in science mm -hmm. right 
Uh, so we don't want to accept these like sharp bifurcations if we can avoid them, like a Cartesian dualism would have between a uh, mind and body or a view that would take humans to be really special and totally different from anything else in the natural world. So we want this kind of uniformity of nature principle. And then we get an argument that you can find back in the 17th century in Margaret Cavendish mm -hmm. um, that is kind of independently rediscovered by Thomas Nagel, who started the contemporary conversation on panpsychism, that's saying basically, uh, look, there, since there's nothing special about humans, any matter anywhere could get kind of arranged into a human, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing special about the matter that composes a human and there's nothing immaterial about a human. That seems like a naturalistic principle. Yep. But if you then think, well, you can't get thought or certain other features of a human just by combining together little bits of stuff bumping into each other, then you're thinking, and yet the human somehow arises just by the matter being put together, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then you're thinking, well, there must be something to that matter besides what right. those 17th century people would have called as mechanical properties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just stuff bumping into each other. There must be, as it were, the materials needed to build a mind mm -hmm. already latent in all the matter in the universe from this like uniformity principle plus the reality of mind. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, so I actually think that's a genuinely naturalistic motivation for panpsychism. Um, we're going to have a lot of debate. You can have a lot of debates about how they interpret neuroscience, about whether they're right in taking psychology to be a genuine science that the naturalist should take guidance from. Right. And, and so on. Um, but I guess there is a real naturalistic motivation for that view, even though it violates Oppie's uh definition of naturalism yeah yeah that's and that's a good point i guess uh so i certainly don't have any issues with putting mind kind of a deeper level of reality obviously not right as a theist uh, or something like mind um and i guess it would be a lot of that would depend on which sciences you feel i guess are allowed to speak or should be privileged right and i guess right. i guess that if you're just going to like physics and chemistry, I think you're going to, you're not going to be able to sustain that view. Right. Um, that's, that's why I think there is the eliminativist line in like right. both the more in the more innocent and the more hardcore fashion, like the more innocent fashion says we should just get rid of the talk of consciousness from science because it doesn't do anything. Right. The harder core fashion says, well, since we need to do that, we should also just say it doesn't exist. <laughs> right? right. But you could be, on the subtler side, like even as a theist, right. And to say, yeah, we don't need to talk about it when we're doing science. So we can eliminate in that sense, but of course, without making the, the, the wider claim as well. I don't know. Any thoughts or comments on, on any yeah, of so with relation to panpsychism particularly. Right. <laughs> yeah. So like in the debate with Oppie, I quote a neuroscience textbook that is endorsing this kind of eliminativist line, but uh, in typical scientific fashion, they don't, really at least immediately make an ontological claim mm -hmm. about consciousness. They just say, uh, this is a miserable thing from a neuroscience perspective. It can't be operationalized. We don't know what to do with it. So we're just replacing it with this other thing, the Glasgow coma scale mm -hmm. that, and they even recognize that as a replacement for the right. notion of consciousness. They're not saying this is an analysis of the notion of consciousness. Right. Right. It's a replacement with something that can be operationalized for neuroscience research. Mm -hmm. And so there may be a kind of implicit scientific instrumentalism there mm -hmm. that we're just doing what works for prediction, you know, rather than something deeper than that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a, uh, you know, that's a kind of tack you can take. But then when you get, for instance, the church lens. Mm -hmm. The church lens are doing something much more radical um, in saying, you know, the notion this, the notion of consciousness is a mistake. It's going to go the way of uh, phlogiston. It's kind of a a feature of an outmoded folk science, right? That we've got to uh, to get rid of and replace with something properly scientific, which is going to be something about neurons, right? Um, and but but all this depends on um, assuming that neither psychology nor cognitive science 
are legitimate sciences that a naturalist can take guidance from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I guess that is brings us to a, a wider consideration of whether naturalism in relation to its motivation should be committed to something like a strong reductionism. Right. I think so, actually. <laughs> oh, so, so I think I know people disagree, but but I think to keep it super interesting. Right. And, sure. and this is what I really agreed with you. Like, boy, if, if I was wrong about my worldview, what would be the second best option here? It was the one that I previously had. Right. And to, to like what makes naturalism really interesting is science rocks. And, and there are repeals uh, appeal or strong appeal to reductionism. Um, and I think the most interesting would would be a strong reductionism. Right. Yeah. So I think the problem with that is that um, the strong reductionism, uh, I think, doesn't actually make sense of the science that actually exists. Oh, um, I, yeah, I agree. I don't think strong reductionism actually works. <laughs> so, I just, yeah. Yeah. Well, and so I think that the from a naturalist perspective, um, maybe there's a way in which naturalism is caught in attention here. Because on the one hand, the strong reductionism to, to kind of physics would make naturalism a really interesting, bold thesis. And that's an idea that's driven a lot of uh, thought and progress since the 17th century scientific revolution yep. and so on. And a lot of naturalist philosophers, including the logical positivists, have really liked that approach. But from a naturalistic perspective, um, you really have to take seriously the actual science and not what you wish science was. Right, right. And yeah. and so, like, we've got, um, you know, even what you would think were the clearest cases of reduction, if you look at the philosophy of science literature, mm -hmm. that's not motivated by, you know, broader concerns about theism versus naturalism or anything. The, the simplistic reduction, reduction as translation, Yep. doesn't seem to work even for thermodynamics to statistical mechanics. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to work for the um, relationship between genes and DNA. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned Tim Maudlin before. His book, The Metaphysics Within Physics, is great at showing how this so-called Humean view, Humean naturalism that people like David Lewis have proposed, is just radically revisionist of contemporary physics. And you actually need more serious metaphysics than the human allows to make sense of what physics actually looks like. And so I think the, the hardcore reductionist version of naturalism is uh, actually failing to take the actual content of science seriously. Mm -hmm. And instead what they're taking seriously is some kind of simplistic philosopher's dream about what they hoped science would be. Yeah, that's that's extremely well stated. And I, I agree with that. I don't think strong reductionism works. And I think it was, I don't know if he's changed his perspective on this in more recent years, but uh, Jaguan Kim, hmm. you know, um, once talked about, um, you know, naturalists typically wanting to reject top-down causation because that would mean in principle you're denying the completability of physics, which from a naturalistic standpoint might um, might be seen as a cost, right? Right. Uh -huh. well, and, and so I think, um, you know, the terminology is a little bit fuzzy, but I think uh, the naturalist who's taking the actual content of science seriously and not engaging in a lot of wishful thinking and kind of, um, you know, being guided by it is going to allow for something more complex and more metaphysical in terms of how um, one science is related to another and in terms mm -hmm. of how everything bottoms out in physics. But they can still hold that physics is in principle completable and that everything bottoms out in physics in the end and so on. Um, they've just got to say, uh, look, it's wrong to think what the logical positivists thought that biology is just some kind of shorthand for physics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and that it could ultimately be translated into the language of physics in a, uh, and that biology won't be completed until biology is just physics. They, right. Like you, that's not how science actually works. 
So qu quick question there, like, but wouldn't we expect that translation to be possible if there is that ontological reduction, right? Shouldn't we expect one from the other, right? Well, this is a, right. So this is a place where it depends on uh, what you mean by reduction. And so mm -hmm. I always try to be very clear that. Yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> that when I'm saying that reduction is, you know, wishful thinking about science that it doesn't fit with actual science. What I mean by reductionism in that context, and again, this is something that the uh, logical positivists, for instance, mainly right. held, mm -hmm. is the idea that the the so-called special sciences are all just shorthand for long and complicated claims in physics. So it's, mm -hmm. a, as it were, a translatability claim or a linguistic claim that um, kind of everything we're saying in biology or psychology or whatever, if it's really true, could be expressed, perhaps not by us, but by some ideal intellect um, in the language of physics. Mm -hmm. um, now, once you've rejected that, there's a lot of different views you could take about uh, what it means for everything to bottom out in physics. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people nowadays have uh, a view of grounding, mm -hmm. right? Which is also, also what I use within my theistic view of the world. Yeah, this but, will be a good segue, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but it's not an inherently theistic approach. And the people who, you know, Kip Fine and Jonathan Schaffer, I think we'll both consider themselves naturalists. And they're mm -hmm. the key people who, you know, brought this into contemporary analytic metaphysics. Um, and so what, what grounding is saying, you know, the idea of, of grounding is that there is a, a metaphysical or ontological dependence there's a, an explanatory relation mm -hmm. that is, at least in Fine's view, tightly connected with essences, yeah. with what it is to be a certain kind of thing. But mm -hmm. this isn't a linguistic relation of translatability. It's a metaphysical relation of dependence. Yep. Um, and so we're going to say things like, what it is for a statue to exist just is for the clay to be a ray or material or whatever to be arranged thus and so with such and such artistic intentions or whatever. When we give this account of what it is for a statue to exist, that's going to make some reference to that underlying material that constitutes the statue, mm -hmm. but not in a way that produces translatability. Yeah. And, and this actually is, you know, it's what we get when they look at the details of the relation, for instance, between thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, that what it is for a region to be filled with gas, right, is something about the kind of what's going on with molecules, mm -hmm. but not in a way that could be translated into some claim about the particular motions of particular molecules. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to do with the way that the that thermodynamics involves averaging and, and things like this makes it much more complicated than um, you can't really say what a gas is by just talking about individual particles. You have to talk about certain kinds of averages and, yeah. and probabilities and things. Um, and the same kind of thing happens in uh, other cases of dependence where where we're saying that kind of something less fundamental depends on something more fundamental um when you say kind of what it is to be a living thing um that explanation is going to make kind of ineliminable reference to to physical arrangements of of things but not in a way that allows us to translate it into the language of physics right yeah so this is this is getting towards the notion of ontological dependence that we want to right. develop in your argument from contingency, which I want to go there right now and maybe briefly uh, just we, we did a whole conversation on this, so we don't have to fill in all the details of it again. But I think it'd be good to get that on the table again before we go to your account of sources of contingency. Um, and maybe a way to angle into this again is I'll, I'll go back to something that I that uh, grabbed my ear in your conversation with uh, with Josh. And this was, in fact, the impression I got when I first read your work. I was fascinated by it. Is I, I just thought like, wow, this this really just is the medieval argument, <laughs> right? It really is. Uh, and it's it's only because um, the notion of cause 
has become so restricted in what it means right. in contemporary philosophy. Whereas for um, people like Aquinas, but even go back to Aristotle, right? It's really just a type of explanation, right? A, a, a type of explanation yeah. for a thing. And it seems like even though they didn't use this language, they were very much committed to the notion of grounding. I mean, even just that, I think if you follow them on their act potency dis distinction, it seems like potency is in some sense grounded in actuality uh, right. most fundamentally. So talk, talk to me about that. Do you, is that a fair assessment of your view? Do you really think that your argument close is, 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 is more bearing a family resemblance to what you see in that medieval tradition than contemporary uh, contingency arguments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And when you uh, look at a lot of the literature on grounding, especially the people who kind of introduced it, like Fine and Schaffer, who I mentioned, they're often calling this the neo-Aristotelian approach to metaphysics. Yeah, yeah. That, and that's, right? uh, uh, Inman's got a great book on that, Ross Inman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so unlike Quine, who's thinking that metaphysics is trying to say what there is, um, the neo-Aristotelian approach, as these folks understand it, thinks uh, what there is is not a very interesting question because um, existence is cheap. <laughs> what the interesting question is what depends on what, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and they're seeing this as pretty clearly going back to Aristotle and I think they're right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think what's, uh, yeah, I was actually motivated to write this paper because I thought that the contemporary presentations of the argument from contingency were missing what was distinctive about it, what made it different from first cause arguments mm -hmm. and uh, what its distinctive strengths were because they were formulating it in terms of causation, which was misunderstanding how to bring those classical ideas forward to the present day. Um, and one of the things that uh, kind of led me that direction is in one of Leibniz's presentations of the argument, he says, though eternal things do not have a cause yet they must nevertheless be understood to have a reason mm, mm -hmm. uh right and so i'm trying to think you know one of the advantages of the contingency argument according to classical proponents is supposed to be that it can be neutral on the question of whether the physical universe has a beginning in time right um and and that's why is that if it's eternal it doesn't have a cause but it must nevertheless have a reason is one of mm -hmm. Leibniz's formulations um, and so I think, and, and by cause we, we mean like something that's like etiological, right? Well, like one physical process unfolding into another one where we're thinking right. about something that's more deeply ontological. Well, why is there any physical process at all? Right. Right. And so what we're talking about cause the nearest medieval equivalent to it would be secondary efficient causation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but yeah, I'm thinking that, you know, cause for us today is a concept coming from the natural sciences, which are different than what Aristotle, you know, how Aristotle and his followers understood them. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to kind of, um, you know, when we're talking about it in this metaphysical way, it's, uh, it's a bit misleading. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, there's a lot of literature out there disputing how close the analogy is between grounding and causation. And some people even say grounding is a type of metaphysical causation. But I do think that we need to distinguish the explanatory relation that's involved in the contingency argument from or our ordinary notion of, of causation. Um, and here, certainly, I would be in agreement with the Thomists, because the Thomists think that nothing can be applied univocally to God and creatures. So obviously, God can't be the same kind of cause that a, that a creature is. Yep. Um, I have maybe a, a difference with um, most Thomists in uh, about the correct way of translating these ideas into 21st century analytic metaphysics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We could get into analogy uh, maybe in a, in a little bit, because that does come up in an interesting way in your discussion with Dr. Oppie as well, of whether if you're going to have to pick up the tool of analogy, whether that's a cost, if so, how big of a cost is it? And I thought you had some, a lot of interesting things to say there. But when I understand, and we just had a nice conversation on this podcast with um, Dr. Ward uh, about about um, SCOTUS, um, SCOTUS, excuse me, um, and he really thinks that uh, the whole fuss of, of analogy between SCOTUS and Thomas is overblown. It's merely a verbal disagreement. They're both committed to stable meaning. Um, it's, it's just the mode 
of signification that differs. The, the meaning really is is stable throughout. And he thinks that solves a, a whole bunch of these issues. And I'm wondering if that would bear relevantly into the debate of whether that incurs an extra cost in the comparison. Um, I don't know. Maybe you had some initial thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, right. So this is something that comes up in the, the debate with Avi. He thinks that... Um, the theist incurs certain uh, costs to simplicity because they need to employ certain concepts for talking about God that in the competing view aren't, um, you know, anywhere in the fundamental theory. Um, but of course, Oppie is committed to mental concepts. He's not an eliminativist. Mm -hmm. And so the sorts of concepts that we use to talk about uh, God are concepts that figure into his worldview. On the other hand, uh, there is this tradition of analogy that's saying we can't be applying those words in precisely the same way. And so how much cost you're incurring um, could be sensitive to specific theories of analogy. Um, you know, traditional theories, it's not just the, um, it's not just the word that's related, right? We are somehow using our concept, mm -hmm. which doesn't apply uh, to God in quite the same way it applies to creatures, but we are somehow applying the same concept in a different way on traditional theories. And so we're not actually introducing totally new concepts into our theory. Um, the, the question then is quite what we are doing you know, I'm inclined to think that we're introducing at least partially new concepts, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. By making some kind of analogical extension. Uh, but that should be considered less costly than introducing totally new concepts. Sure. Yeah. Maybe we could have a different conversation on that because at least certain Thomists, um, my friend Gavin Kerr wants to say that what is signified is definitely the same, for example, goodness, but it's just the, the mode by which it is signified is, but yeah. Anyways, I, I like you, you kind of in your book, I remember you kind of gave like three different ways the theist could handle this. And even if you do accept that it, it's a cost, it's kind of a negligible cost in the grand yeah. scheme of how things bear out. So getting back now to your argument from grounding, let's um, I guess quickly get on the table. Uh, one thing that 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 um, again, this came up with your conversation with Josh and the, the reason to grab my ears is something I'm very interested in uh, of of how you deal with issues of fundamentality and infinite regress and, and stuff like that. And then we'll get right into the sources of contingency because it'll drive right to it. And it sounds to me like your appeal to grounding is very much like an appeal to per se causation or essentially ordered causation. Right. And I've always thought that that was the strongest. Uh, Josh, who I think is brilliant. I agree with him a lot of things, thinks you can just make use of plural reference. Right. Uh, but you kind of said that is still a little controversial still. Right. Um, right. You know, uh, I think it's very plausible, right? And I think it's a it's a good move. But I, like you, always thought this this notion of an essentially ordered series does a lot of work. It's very it's very forceful in the sense that if you can situate something in an essentially ordered series, it seems like it's necessarily terminating or it's not explanatory, right? Uh, that's how I've always sort of understood it. So maybe you want to spell that out for us quickly. Uh, just give the, the, the quick summary of what the argument is, and then let's get into sources of contingency because I don't want to keep you here all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I think, um, you know, I don't normally use the the Thomistic language, and I'm not always sure that I myself fully understand the some of the technical notions of, of Thomism. But I do think, you know, one of the things about how grounding is standardly understood in people like Kip Fine, as I was saying before, is that there's this kind of reference or inclusion relation among essences, mm -hmm. right? And so the the dependence arises from what it is to be questions, which is what makes this so Aristotelian, mm -hmm. right? So we're trying to figure out what it is to be a horse or something. Yeah. And this is going to make reference to other essences that are going to kind of uh, explain, you know, what it is to be a horse and you're not going to be able to be a horse without being a material living thing, for instance. Right. Um, and the and so we're going to kind of go down by levels here. Um, and Leibniz talks about this relation sometimes as a as a relation of borrowed reality, which is a nice metaphor, right? That the 
the higher level things borrow their reality from the, the lower level things or they derive their reality from the lower level things. Um, and so it does seem that there's something more puzzling or more problematic about an infinite regress of that kind where we never kind of find out what it ultimately is to be a thing. We never have any kind of ultimate explanation of what anything is. Um, that seems like it might be more problematic than the causal regress because on the kind of contemporary notion of causation, uh, especially post Hume cause and effect are distinct, mm -hmm. right? So a, a cause gives rise to something distinct from itself, but a ground gives rise to something that is in some sense, nothing over and above the ground. And the statue is in some sense, nothing over and above the clay because of these inclusion relations of essences or things like that. Um, and so we have to kind of ultimately get to what there really is when we're following out this grounding hierarchy in this way. Do you think, um, have you ever read, uh, uh, Barry Miller's work, by the way? Um, I don't think so. So he's a really interesting philosopher. He's in inspired me in a lot of ways, but he makes a similar point that you're doing, uh, concerning the infinite regress when you s get it into its right sort of logical form, the type of causal regress or deep ontological dependence that we're talking about. He thinks it's expressed by a uh, reduplicative expressions, right? A is caused to G by B in as much as it is being caused to G by C in as much as it is being caused to G by. And Miller wants to say that there's a very fundamental point here and that's nothing can be explanatory unless it is a closed category, uh, a closed categorical sentence, right? Hmm. And the reason is nothing can be explanatory unless it actually says something, right? <laughs> and, the lo and the logical form of this cannot be a closed category uh, categorical sentence unless it terminates right in something like you know being caused by m or whatever that is right? right so unless it terminates it doesn't say anything ultimately and unless it says anything it can't explain anything ultimately yeah right so i was just wondering if that if they if that's sort of the similar thought in your mind with somebody yeah i mean that's helpful in terms of the contrast between grounding and causation right mm -hmm. um in that we're like the cause is can be seen as a complete thing on its own and the effect is a complete thing on its own. And there's this relation between them right. whereby the cause produces the effect, mm -hmm. but that's not how grounding is understood because we're saying we're kind of trying to drill down into what it really is to be a horse or whatever. And right. And so that has to bottom out or else, yeah, we'll have this kind of problematic incompleteness where we never quite manage to say what it is to be a horse. Yeah. So long story short, you think you need to terminate this and, and can terminate it and should terminate it in God. And there is uh, not a brute fact there, but an autonomous fact, which I think is right. uh, brilliantly situated. Uh, God is a necessary being. And now we have the issue of and you can spell out any of that if you want to. We've had the previous conversation. People aren't familiar. But now we have the issue of getting the contingency from the necessity. Right. So. Right. Finally, we're at the heart of the problem after that long, windy conversation. But thank you for entertaining all of my <laughs> kind right. of selfish questions uh, along the way. So do we want to just hop into it right here, um, sure. it, it, Dr. Pierce? If people are wondering, well, how did he get to God and all this? We have an entirely separate conversation on that as well. And of course, uh, I'm going to highly recommend uh, your, your your work on this Uh I think it was a, your 2017 article was when it first came out and mm -hmm. then um, more recently in discussion with Dr. Oppi. Uh, so, yeah. So how do you like to solve uh, maybe first frame the issue of, of how do we get the contingent from the necessary? How do we avoid this necessitarian sure. consequence that it seems we want to avoid? And and uh, and yeah, please. Yeah. Take it from here. Emil. Yeah. So so just kind of to set up the problem, it's widely thought that grounding claims necessitate. Mm -hmm. Right. So if the statue is grounded in the clay then it's necessary that if the clay is arranged this way, the statue exists. Um, that's kind of a standard view. Uh, now, I argue that any type of metaphysical rationalist, that is mm -hmm. someone who thinks that um, everything that is apt for grounding is ultimately grounded, everything that requires metaphysical explanation is ultimately explained. This is this formulation is coming from Shemik the Skupta. I think anyone who holds that view needs to think that somewhere there is what I call indeterministic grounding mm. in order to save contingency, which for reasons we talked about at the beginning, I think we need to do. Um, what I mean by indeterministic grounding 
is that the very same ground in the very same circumstances could have grounded something else or nothing at all. Mm. That is, the the grounded entity didn't have to exist despite the fact that the that we had this ground in the, these circumstances. Now, some people think that is just uh, just totally incoherent, at least if we're talking about total grounding, complete grounding, because we couldn't have a complete explanation, right? Unless we ruled out all of the alternatives by means of our explanation. Um, now that view, uh, I think is mistaken that we have to rule out all of the alternatives in order to have a complete explanation. Um, there's already kind of some literature out there arguing that that view um, has actually bad consequences for the completeness of physics. Hmm. Um, because if you're thinking about like that, the uh, the physical theory of the Higgs boson explains the uh, measurements that were recorded by the LHC. Well, it explains those only probabilistically. It doesn't rule out every other possible uh, distribution of data. Mm. Right. And that's the case, no matter how, you know, even if we imagine kind of perfect knowledge or as perfect as is in principle possible in physics, it doesn't rule out every alternative distribution that you could get in those measurements. Yeah. It explains them probabilistically. And what we should say is that it provides a complete explanation, right? That is the, the theory together with the experimental setup, right? And the causal relations at, fully explains um, why they uh, recorded those data, Mo you know, modulo some other issues about imperfections in the experimental apparatus and yada, yada, sure. yada. But, you know, in principle, it's a complete explanation if we like physics to be complete. Um, and so in general, with these indeterministic causes, um, the way we can think of it kind of intuitively is that the cause has all the oomph it takes to produce the effect, right? That is, it doesn't take anything further beyond this cause to produce that effect. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be the case even if the cause could have produced a different effect somehow. Right. Um, and then we want to say the same thing about grounding, that there's a type of, um, as it were, metaphysical oomph uh, that is enough to produce the grounded entity Mm -hmm. um, we're producing the grounding sense is of course not understood temporally as one thing following another, but of kind of explaining why it exists or how it arises. Uh, even though there could have been something else. Right. Quickly. I just, since I've we've got the scholastics online, do you think that their, uh, distinction that they draw between a potential cause versus an act and actually causing cause is relevant here, you know, so like in as much as, as an effect is already produced, it's demanded or necessitated by the cause, but that's true, but trivial in a sense, right? Obviously if something is generated, it can't in the same respect be not generated, but that doesn't seem to say that it couldn't have been otherwise in a prior sense, either logically or temporally in relation to what that cause was. I mean, I think free will is the easiest, right? Insofar as I've chosen yeah. to, hold an apple, given that I'm holding the apple, it's necessity, the, the suppositional necessity, right? Uh, right? But me, as the underlying cause, I could have held a pair instead, right? Um, does that relate to what you're saying at all, is, is my question? Yeah, so that sounds uh, that sounds pretty similar. I'm not mm -hmm. familiar with the details of those particular medieval texts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we get another approach in some medieval texts that's saying kind of... Um, when all the requisites are present, then the thing has to happen. That sounds more like the necessitating view. Mm -hmm. um, so there is, yeah, so there is um, something going on in that debate about whether it's possible for all the requisites to be present and the events not to occur. Mm -hmm. That does seem like it's pretty closely analogous. And that comes up, I think, in the, uh, I think that comes up in Molina. Right, that's one of the ways Molina formulates libertarianism. This is a view on which you could have all the requisites and still not have the action. Right, right. Okay, sorry to get sidetracked again. So yeah, please keep pushing us forward with your, because you ultimately put out four different plausible models here. And I always like articles like this. You don't have to decide on just one. It's just here's a range of, of options that uh, show that there's there's a good amount of room here, right? For right. So, so my idea, and this is just a draft at, at this point that I that I shared with you. Mm -hmm. um, but my uh, the idea that I'm working out here 
um, the, the question is, if you're endorsing classical theism in particular, mm -hmm. where do you insert that indeterministic grounding that you need mm -hmm. in the story of how the world arises from God uh, in order to get contingency? And so there's further work about kind of of these four places that I identify, you know, should we endorse some or all of them? Um, which ones get us the right scope of contingency relative to the arguments for why we should have contingency at all, mm -hmm. and so on. But I put them in kind of an order of um, when, that's not a temporal when, but kind of in the logical ordering of the, uh, or the grounding order, if you like, mm -hmm. of the universe arising from God, where do they occur, mm. right? Um, and so the, the first... Uh, the first place you can put them is basically the Molinist place, which is that um, somehow the, the Molinist maintains there are facts about what possible free creatures would do if God created them and placed them in certain circumstances, mm -hmm. would freely do. Um, and I try to give uh, an account of that by saying that the, um, the essences are grounded in God's intellectual activity which is prior to God's volitional activity. Mm -hmm. So God kind of thinks the stuff up before God decides to create it. Um, and we can have this story about the uh, essences of free creatures indeterministically grounding these counterfactuals. And this, one of the things I draw on here is, so this, this idea was suggested by Tian Chun Lo, um, previously that we could see them as as kind of indeterministically grounded in the essences in their divine mind and you also can appeal to an idea that uh rasmussen and Proust have defended which is that you can explain a counterfactual conditional by stating what would explain the consequent if the antecedent were actual mm -hmm. so the idea is um if somebody offered me a hundred dollars for nothing, for nothing, you know, for free, handed it to me, I would accept it, right? Something mm -hmm. like that. If, if we have that statement, like, well, go to the scenario where I get the offer and accept it, right? And something in that scenario, in that scenario, something in my psychology is going to explain why I accept it. Mm -hmm. And if libertarianism is true as the Molinist thinks, and I'm not super committed to libertarianism, but the Molinist thinks libertarian. I'm more committed to libertarianism than I am Molinism. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm. Yeah, I'm more committed to uh, to metaphysical rationalism, to universal explanation of everything. Right. Than either, and I think um, Molinism might have a role to play in how you reconcile libertarianism with uh, metaphysical rationalism. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure it actually makes us more free than theological compatibilism. So. I, I, that's actually one of my issues of Bolinism is I, I think that aside from the grounding objection, which I know you mentioned that Proust and Rasmussen's um, account could actually be, be used by the Molinist right. is something they suggest, which I think is a very interesting thing. I don't know. I just don't think Molinism fundamentally solves <laughs> the issues that it hopes to is my biggest issue with it. I've mentioned to you privately. I'm quite a fan of uh, Matthew Grant's uh, work right, right. on this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but in that world, in that possible world where right. I'm offered the money with no strings and I take it, um, there's going to be some facts about my psychology that explain why I made that decision. Mm -hmm. And if libertarianism is true, they're going to explain without necessitating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but what we can say is, well, what explains the fact that if I got the offer, I would accept it, is that if I got the offer... I would be in such and such psychological states, which would explain my accepting the offer, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and those should be regarded by the libertarian, I think, as complete explanations, even though not deterministic. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right to me. Uh -huh. um, and so then, so that's um, one way, right? We don't sac sacrifice metaphysical rationalism. Everything's fully explained. And the analogy that I like for this, which some other people like Sam Liebens and Megan Page have also used, is if we think about God, um, the dependence of essences on God 
as something like the way an author thinks up possible fictions or possible characters. Mm -hmm. um, and it is an interesting thing that a lot of authors kind of report that once they have thought up the characters, the characters are experienced as making certain demands on them. Mm -hmm. That like this story just has to be continued this way, or this character just has to do this. There's no other way of doing it, mm -hmm. right? It's not that the author literally can't write the story in another way. It's that the integrity of the character would somehow be violated if they did. Right, right. And this is a really good analogy for what the Molinist wants to say, mm -hmm. because it's not that God can't force me to make a different decision. It's that right. doing so would violate my integrity, my free will. Yeah, that reminds me of, again, the old other classic distinction between God's absolute versus ordained power. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I think it is related to that. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing you want to say is that God can bring it about that I act differently, but God can't bring it about that I freely act differently. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because the freely is kind of building in God's respecting my autonomy, everything respecting my autonomy, nothing interfering with my autonomy, right? And allowing me to uh, to act mm -hmm. in the way that follows non-deterministically from my essence. Right. But that's still compatible with a wider theological worldview that God might give special graces to certain people to act particular yeah. ways at certain times. But there's this general principle of, I like to think of it as a principle of divine governance related to ordained power right. of why God would do it this this way, right? Yeah, of course, even the most, ra in, the, in the kind of Christian theological tradition, even the most radical anti-Pelagians have, uh, including like John Calvin, um, well, maybe Calvin is at fully consistent on this in all of his writings, but the Westminster Confession anyway, as a standard mm -hmm. presentation of Calvinism, um, insists that although grace is irresistible, it nevertheless doesn't override free will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an Augustinian Platonist view that kind of, that, that's related to what the thing, the idea I mentioned in Ibn Sina previously, that kind of just a clear enough intellectual vision of the good would uh lead you irresistibly to it right in a like way it, that because it it draws you rather than pushing you it doesn't violate your autonomy it actually makes you more free right and that's the notion of heaven and why there can't be sin in heaven right is this if you see the the good the supreme good face right. to face then then those that sort of kicks in right mm -hmm. yeah so then of course if, if you buy that mm -hmm. uh as augustine and calvin do um then you've and, and maybe aquinas uh probably aquinas i think um, then you, um, have a question about why God doesn't do that all the time because mm -hmm. it doesn't violate our autonomy to kind of supernaturally give us this vision of the good that is so compelling that we can't resist it. Right. right? It actually makes us more free and it, it enables us to act with greater autonomy. Yep. Um, so, um, yeah, but that's a separate conversation, right? Yeah. I think it, 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 the objection is, well, why didn't God just create us all in heaven, right? Uh, that's, yeah, kind so, of, that's, that's kind of what the objection is, right? Yeah, so I just want to say, it um, the, the Molinist view can and should allow, and any theological libertarian view, can and should allow that God has the power to override human free will, right? Uh, most Christian theological views, no matter how irresistible they think grace is, have usually held that it doesn't violate free will or autonomy um but that's not quite universal perhaps some kind of radical calvinists have uh have held that it does um but then there's this other thing this other question about then uh, you know if even that kind of irresistible grace doesn't uh violate or override autonomy then does god ever actually do that mm -hmm. maybe the answer is no maybe i tend to think that would be inconsistent with divine goodness because i have a Kantian conception of moral goodness. And I think, I actually think God has moral obligations to us to respect our autonomy, which is a uh, a view where I'd be kind of in pretty strong disagreement with most Thomas. Well, no, no, not not this one. First off, I, I resist labels like that because as soon as you say that you're a, an ist of any sort, people come with their bundle of assumptions, which may not apply to you. So sure. I'm very much inspired by Tom, Thomas in many ways. I'm also very much inspired by Scotus and uh, a million other people, right? Uh, and there's issues on with Thomas where I, I I disagree, or it's like I'm not sure if that's Thomas's position, but if it was, I would disagree, right? Um, and I'm I'm actually with you because there are some Thomas who push the line very strongly that God's not a moral agent or this or that, and I think that's 
I think that's both false and not Thomas's view, right? right. Thomas has his threefold way to God, where God, we really can have a meaningful grasp of God, not, not a full comprehension, right? That I think like, yeah, maybe we shouldn't expect the same things of God that we would expect from each other as human beings, but we can still, I think, make strong and broad moral expectations right. of God. And, and, um, so I, all to say, I'm in broad agreement with you there. Yeah. And I think otherwise you're equivocating on goodness, right? It's just like, what the heck are we even talking about, right? If God could just treat us yeah. any old way whatsoever, that seems absurd to me, right? Uh -huh. Well, I think there's a, I think for the kind of more reasonable Thomist view, um, we might have to be more careful about what we mean by obligation, right? That is, the more reasonable Thomist view would say, God doesn't, owe anything to anyone such that someone could make demands or try to hold God accountable or something. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, the divine goodness assures us that God won't act in certain ways. And that might look similar to what we call obligation. Right. Or the, um, and linked to the divine wisdom too. Yeah. And like actually that. Kant himself says that in a certain sense, the moral law is inapplicable to a holy will mm -hmm. because God uh, could never feel it as a, a command, as an imperative. Mm -hmm. right um the moral law with respect to god is in a way somewhat more like a natural law mm -hmm. that is it it kind of it tells us how god acts but it doesn't demand anything of god because it's metaphysically impossible that god act contrary to it and so what would be the point of demanding right you know so that's kind of a more reasonable view i but, yeah uh, that's the one i like yeah uh -huh. yeah there's some neo thomists who think that the fact that god doesn't have moral obligations makes the problem of evil go away and and that view is the one that I think ends up saying, like, that we don't mean anything when we call God good. Uh, I agree right. with you. Yeah. Totally. It's like, so I can see why some people like that, because it's kind of a, a quick way to just get rid of the problem of evil. But I think it invites a whole, like, I think it just, <laughs> what it invites is so much worse, right? right. <laughs> it's like, just give a theodicy. Come on, let's do the work and do the theodicy yeah, and right. let's not go that position, right? Yeah, I'm 100%. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, continue back on track now, wherever we left off, right? Okay, <laughs> like sure. Sources of contingency. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's so that's the first source is the Molinist idea that, as it were, when God thinks up the essences of possible creatures, mm -hmm. those essences, um, it kind of follows indeterministically from those essences that free creatures would act in certain ways as described by the Molinist conditionals. Yep. Um, and and that God can't make them act otherwise without violating their autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, if God's going to let them kind of act in a way that's a working out of their essence, then they're going to act in this way. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's the, the first few. So if you're a Molinist, that's probably the one you should lean towards, right? <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. that's, and again, the, the kind of basic idea of this comes from Tian Chen Lo. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working out some of the details in a slightly different way than, than he does. But I think this is, it made me take Molinism seriously in a way that I hadn't before. Mm -hmm. Um, when I kind of came across this idea. Mm -hmm. Um, so then the second place we get is into uh, divine choice. And the first there is that there might be contingent divine values or preferences. Um, I find this view in an obscure 18th century philosopher, William King. He was the Anglican Archbishop of Dublin. Yeah. Um, there's also a version of it uh, endorsed recently by uh, Fatima Amaji, who's a philosopher at uh, British Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is the view that it's consistent with the divine, um, with the kind of divine perfection to have different preferences or values. Um, and a way you might think about this is that there's a lot of kind of, there might be a trading off, say, of simplicity of laws versus variety of phenomena. And Leibniz talks about God getting an ideal balance between those two. Mm -hmm. But maybe there is no one ideal balance. Maybe it depends on how much you like simplicity and how much you like, uh, you like variety. Right. And maybe there's no one right answer to how much a perfect being would like those. Mm -hmm. Um. And then we have similarly lots of other values or things that God might like. Um, you know, there's some question about whether God could like red more than blue or would that just be too arbitrary? Yeah. Um, but uh, if we start here, then we can start thinking that in a similar way, 
there might be these values or preferences that God places on things that might follow indeterministically from God's essence. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be somehow intelligible in terms of the, the divine essence, not necessarily intelligible to us, let's say, but in principle explicable how these uh, something in God needs to explain uh, why God might place this much value on this and that much value on that, mm -hmm. but it might on this sort of view, nevertheless be contingent. Um, and this actually fits nicely with a Kantian view of divine goodness, incidentally, mm -hmm. because the Kantian thinks that um, the moral law requires us to adopt certain things as ends, but it doesn't necessarily um, tell us, how to weight those ends against each other or how much to be willing to, to promote them. So one of, so if you're thinking about like this, um, like Peter Singer stuff and the uh, effect of altruism, that's all over the, uh, you know, Twitter debates and stuff right now. Um, Peter Singer is thinking like utilitarianism gives you an answer to how much of your own happiness you should be willing to sacrifice for the betterment of uh, others, regardless of whether they're close or far to you. And it gives this precise answer to how much you should value strangers compared to your close friends, mm -hmm. which is to say that you should actually value them exactly equally, although you might have better information on how to benefit your close friends. Mm -hmm. And so it might be a better use of resources sometimes, right? Um, utilitarianism is saying there's one exact right answer to all of that. Yeah. Kant says at one point that you know, the moral law requires us to adopt the happiness of others as one of our ends, as one of our goals to make others happy. And it thereby requires us to be willing to sacrifice our own happiness for the sake of the benefit of others. But the moral law as such doesn't tell us exactly how big a sacrifice we should be willing to make. Mm -hmm. it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't have prescriptions that are that precise for us. Um, and so you kind of, you know, if somebody's unwilling to make trivial sacrifices that have big consequences for others, then you start thinking they don't really value the happiness of others at all. Yeah. Right. But um, but the the kind of exact balancing of that isn't something that the moral law prescribes. When we make those sacrifices, it's meritorious, or as philosophers today sometimes say, super erogatory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, all the moral law requires is a general willingness to make those kinds of sacrifices. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're coming from that Kantian perspective, obviously it's it's not coherent to talk about God sacrificing God's own happiness. Mm -hmm. But you can think in a similar way of God trading off values against each other and of moral perfection and rational perfection and so on, not prescribing exactly what the right trade-offs are. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And you're coming from that Kantian perspective, so that's an attractive one for you, right? <laughs> right. Right, yeah. And it's attractive to me in, in other senses as well. I guess, I don't know, maybe I try to play a little too friendly, but I often tend to try and look for, and I think I, I genuinely find more compatibility between certain positions than conflict. You know, we mentioned with yeah. Thomas and Scotus before, but I think even Thomism and, 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 and Kantianism have a lot of uh, compatibility as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually... Um... I, I snuck into a I snuck into a paper once the uh, the implication that Kant was a Thomist and nobody noticed. Nobody no, um, nobody picked so, up on that one. That's, that's right. So, said, so that some some philosophers in the Thomistic some philosophers in the Thomistic tradition have said that um, have said that there's no real distinction between uh, God's knowledge of an object and that object's existence, and yeah. then cited Kant. There you go. <laughs> There you go. No, anything. So no, so I do I do think there's a real um yeah. in Kant's metaphysics of God, um, I think there is a real Thomistic influence. Right. I also think I really, really recommend the work of Christine Korsgaard, mm. um, who sees kind of Plato, Aristotle, and Kant. And of course, if you and of course Aquinas would be a natural fit in that same progression. Right as coming from the same concerns to some extent where you kind of come out of Plato's Republic. Yeah. And the question of the Republic, according to her, is about how you unify the soul in order to live and act as one person rather than an incoherent jumble of desires. Yep. 
And so the whole, like one of her more recent treatments of it, the book is called Self-Constitution, mm -hmm. right? And it, of course, is a play on that, on Plato, talk about a political constitution as, and, and you need something like a political constitution to put the self together. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this can easily be connected with Neoplatonic ideas that influenced Aquinas about how falling away from the good is somehow falling away from existence. Mm, mm -hmm. right good and existence and unity are all one and the same yeah i heard you bring that up with josh and i was like i am on the same page with dr pierce yet again right mm -hmm. and i like how you describe it too i guess what do you say when you were younger you saw all those commitments and you thought i don't need them I'll throw right. them all out right and now you realize it was like an ikea an ikea set and you threw out a bunch of stuff. it didn't seem important at the time but now maybe we do need that stuff in there right right right, right. well and so the thing i the the yeah. Um, you know, the course guard view has it that, which, which, I mean, it's in Plato, but it's not how I would have read Plato before reading course guard, right? Yeah. So evil, doing evil is somehow literally falling apart. Yes. When an uh -huh. agent does evil, they are falling apart. Right. And, um, and so course guard several times in self-constitution uses this phrase, pull yourself together. Yeah. That, you know, that we use as an exhortation. She's like, that's actually what moral action and practical reason more generally is all about. Yeah. Is, is trying to pull yourself together. Right. I really, um, yeah, I really like that. And I always liked, Alex Proust said at one time, like, he just was like, yeah, the privation theory of evil, like, has to be true. Haven't really worked it out yet, but like, something like that just has to be true. And now I know he's given some recent attempts to get around certain right. issues. And, and that always seemed right to me, certainly if you're a theist, right? I think like something yeah. in that vicinity like has to be the case, right? And there's, there's, right. but it also just seems to make really good sense of things too, that there is something about us kind of falling apart when we do evil, right? And it's very, and I agree with you, you know, it's so funny when people read different people in Plato, it completely shifts their perspective. Gerson did that for me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and his stuff on Plato just completely shit to how I read Plato. But I think it would be certainly in agreement with everything that's that's yeah. being said here. A mm -hmm. thing a thing that really, maybe this is a little off topic, but a thing that really um, influenced me in terms of ceasing to think of the Neoplatonic stuff as a problematic accretion on Christian theology in general mm -hmm. is Athanasius on the Incarnation. Mm. That's one of my, that's, that's my vote for best post-biblical Christian book. All right. <laughs> I recommend it to everybody. I go around trying to convince church Bible studies to read it. I don't think it's only for scholars. It's for everybody. Great. Well, um, we're going to, we're going to link it in the comments and the resources. Yeah, so the, do that, yeah. The, the thing, the thing that's like amazing about that is Athanasius thinks the, the way he frames the whole problem that to which the incarnation is the solution mm -hmm. is that God said, let us make man in our own image. And then God said, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And when they sinned, they brought those two decrees into conflict. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right? That is, it threatened to undo the creation of the human race in the mm -hmm. image of God. And there's this kind of falling away that... And, and so the incarnation for Athanasius, it has to happen because it's impossible that a divine decree could be annulled. Mm. And it's the only way that both of those divine decrees can be fulfilled. Mm. Um, and so there's this like falling away in terms of like failing to be what you are. Right. Right. That somehow God created the human race as a particular sort of image of God. And somehow we are all the time just falling away. And he keeps saying they threaten to fall into non-being, mm -hmm. right? That is, that is we're, we're somehow constantly ceasing to be human. Right. Doing evil. Mm -hmm. And we have to be restored. Yeah. Yeah. And I will just, uh, so I, I have not read that, but I'm going to make a priority of it. But it just reminds me of a lot of Eleanor Stump's work as well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, her wandering in darkness, which again I heard you mention, is yeah. beautiful. But she's got a more recent article on Aquinas' theory of goodness, and kind of gets into the weeds, the, the mechanical weeds of it. But I think it just is, just seems right to me, right? Especially when you had the distinctions of, of first versus second actuality, and to mm -hmm. perform immoral acts is to fail to have that 
being, which is relevant to your specifying potency. That's the key, right? Mm -hmm. you, you need the specifying potency because otherwise, well, Pat, you'd have more being if you're a lot fatter, right? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, but that's not relevant to the kind of thing that I am, right? <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the way I always, the way I always like to explain the kind of Plutonic um, and, and um, Aristotelian kind of relation between being and goodness is like, if you think about a, if you think about a knife and, you know, this is a common example because virtue is excellence. And so they're very Greek, Greek thinkers are very happy to talk about the virtue of a knife or the excellence of a knife yep. mm -hmm. um, is, is for cutting. Right. And if the blade is dull, you've got a bad knife, but it's still a knife. Mm -hmm. But there's some point where it becomes such where it's no longer a bad knife. It's just not a knife at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if the blade has fallen off or like if it's just round mm -hmm. and, and doesn't even have it doesn't have a dull edge. It doesn't have an edge at all. Mm -hmm. Right. There's there's some point as it falls away from being a good knife that it ceases to be a knife altogether. Mm -hmm. Um. And so if you're thinking about the kind of goodness as goodness in its kind, then this privation theory makes a lot more sense. Right. That it's kind of, the evil is kind of a falling away from being what you are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I'm glad we got to explore that because that's a great topic. All right. So how do we swing back around now to, uh, <laughs> right. So we can talk about goodness. <laughs> Just oh. hard shift. That's all right. We do that a lot in the right. podcast, right? Oh, okay. So the second source of contingency is contingent divine preferences or values. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that on certain theories that might be consistent with perfect goodness and perfect rationality right. that God, um, could, it might be indeterministically grounded in God's nature mm -hmm. that God prefers or values things to different degrees. Yes. Yes. You know what? Maybe this is jumping the gun a little bit, but it, because I know you're going to talk about Proust and Proust's account. Um, yeah. But since it, I think it kind of is another compatibility with, with Kantian, at least a lot of modern Thomists, or they might be modern Scotists, depending, I guess, how you read them. Somebody like Yves Simone, right? Um, he's got this wonderful book, Freedom of Choice. And he just insists, because uh, people are worried about arbitrariness, right? They're worried about arbitrariness. And he just insists that the power of the will just is the ability to make efficacious any finite motive for action, mm -hmm. right? Um, so he thinks at some point it, it becomes a mistake to ask why did Susie choose to play Billy Joel versus Elton John, right? He wants to think that you're actually misunderstanding what the power of the will is, which is to make efficacious any finite motive for action, right? right? Um I don't know if you want to comment that on now, but it just, when I was reading your account of Proust's account, it, it just right. kind of brought that to, to mind. Yeah. So that is, that is related. Um, I, you know, I want to say in order for, um, I don't like these sorts of views that as it were, uh, just take it as brute that the will removes indifference between motives. I want, uh, the explanation to be a bit more substantive than that. If it's going to kind of, be an expression of agency in a strong enough way to like kind of tie to the agent's character and make them responsible for it and kind of be yeah. an expression. Mm -hmm. But I'm fine with saying like the, this is explained in terms of the motives that the agent has. Right. And in the totality of like, given the totality of their motive of the motivations that the agent has, uh, that totality could equally well have explained a contrary action. Yes, right. But nevertheless, that kind of total motivational state explains the action the agent took. And I think that is similar to the Proust view, which he takes to be Aquinas's view. I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not into interpretive debates about Aquinas. Uh, uh, neither am I. I just say, hey, I don't know if it is. If it is, I like it. If it's not, no big deal. I still like it, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so, Proust, so, so on Proust's view, there are incommensurable goods. And this mm -hmm. is closely related to the um to the contingent values view in fact I, I don't think there's much motivation for holding both of them together although they are compatible yeah um because i think they kind of generate roughly the same scope of contingent of contingency in similar ways so on the proust view there are these incommensurable goods like beauty and pleasure or simplicity and variety that um you just can't rate them on the same scale that's what incommensurable means. So they're neither better nor worse nor equal to each other. 
um, because they don't belong on the same scale. And one of the neatest moves that Proust makes is to argue that persons are non-fungible. You can't just substitute one person for another, even if they are very similar people. Mm -hmm. And so a loving, meaningful relationship with one person is always incommensurable with a loving, meaningful with relationship another with another person. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, or should be, right? You don't have the right kind of relationship if you can actually rate them. Uh, you just have to say they're totally different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and so Proust is thinking that when there is this kind of incommensurability, a rational agent can choose any non-dominated option, which is to say um, uh, it's a genuine option if there's no other option that is determinately better than it, yep. which means that on um, kind of either on every scale they're incommensurate or on every scale the non-dominated option is better or there's like a mixed result where they're better in some ways and worse in others. Mm -hmm. And we can't overall, uh, we can't overall rate them. So when that happens, then um, a perfectly rational agent can choose any of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think Proust kind of interprets the guise of the good uh, thesis as implying that uh, we can't actually choose a dominated option. And then he has to give a an account of what it is for us to choose badly, or rather an option we take to be dominated, right? According to our own ranking. Yep. Um, because otherwise your action would be unintelligible. You have to kind of see something attractive in the option and that has to explain why you take it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you know of another option that is better than it in every way, then that's just not intelligible that you would choose it. It would be some kind of random fluke, mm -hmm. right? And not an intelligible decision. So it's got to be that there's some way in which it's better and that's what you're paying attention to. Yep. Um, so that's kind of the Proust view. And if you apply that to God, then again, you get this similar, like the trade-offs between simplicity and variety mm -hmm. um, and things like that, that you can use to generate some uh, contingency. Yeah. And again, I think indeterministic grounding is the best way to understand how this is happening. Yeah. That, yeah. And that's really good. I, I, I've always uh, been attracted to uh, Proust's perspective on this. And uh, I really like, I was excited when I saw you situate that into the grounding framework too. Uh -huh. We got another one though yet still to go, right? If, yeah, so the last one is um, if- Table of options, we're giving people options here. You don't have to pick, yeah. And in the article, you know, you're, or the draft, you say like, you just have to pick at least one of these, right? <laughs> so, so look, like we said earlier, I don't really think that Molinism, um, provides a more robust form of freedom mm -hmm. than theological compatibilism. Mm -hmm. um, it, there, the thing that the indeterministic grounding framework made me realize is that there might be other ways in which it's attractive. And especially I found the author fiction analogy helpful for that. Yeah, that is neat. Mm -hmm. But, um, but if you think that um, God uh, that it's possible that God create creatures who are free in a more robust way than that. Um, which let's be clear, that is a controversial thesis because necessarily everything depends on God, any classical thesis is going to say, right? Yep. Um, and so how robust a kind of freedom or independence from God autonomy is going to be consistent with the kind of dependence that every classical theist endorses is a question. But suppose you think there's a possibility for a more robust form of creaturely freedom, then of course that's going to get you another uh, variety of contingency, one that is subsequent to God's choice. Mm -hmm. So after God chooses what world to create, after of course not in a temporal sense, but subsequent to it somehow in the grounding or causal hierarchy, mm -hmm. um, you could get this kind of um, this this kind of indeterminism coming from creaturely choices. And I discuss a bit some technical matters about how you might see the grounding and causation, um, indeterminism and grounding and causation go together there on different sorts of approaches. But of course, this is one of the most explored in the existing literature um, yeah. is the idea that we might generate indeterminism by means of creaturely freedom uh, right. subsequent to God's choice. Yeah, that's great. And so a lot of this project, I guess, came out because... Uh... Uh, I guess maybe you face the objection that, hey, if you go grounding, Dr. Pierce, you're stuck with necessitarianism. And now you're like, no, not so fast. Is that? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And I mean, yeah. I was trying to, I, you know, I've said a couple of times, well, there's this traditional view. I see it in Leibniz, for instance, that uh, classical theism is just what we need for explaining contingency because a free and rational choice can fully explain something without necessitating it. Yeah. Um, and then there's this kind of objection coming back to that, that, well, if you have a traditional God who is uh, perfectly good and perfectly rational, uh, then you don't actually avoid necessitarianism at all. Mm -hmm. um, and like we were saying at the beginning, there may be some question about how bad that is, yeah. but um, I think it's bad enough. And uh, I also think it, you know, that biting that bullet would take away one of theism's advantages over some competing views. Yep. Um, and so I was kind of trying to work out what exactly is the best way of thinking about how contingency might arise uh, from a necessary perfect being. Yeah, and I think you've done a great job at it. I remember I was reading one of your, might have been in, in the in the in the debate book. I think you said that, or you admitted that. Yeah, I think this is one of the harder problems. So it's it's cool to then see you now developing and and, and tackling that. Right. I always just right. find that I like following people's lines of thought on things. All right, it, before we wrap up, this has been a really tremendous conversation. We covered a lot of different territory, and I was a little, I guess, selfish with the topics at times, but uh, so be it. <laughs> um, just was really curious your, your thoughts on a lot of different things. Is there anything we haven't covered in relation to this particular topic? Anything else you want to mention about it? Uh, otherwise, I want to make sure that we discuss your book and future projects as well. Um, sure. So uh, I'll just let me just reemphasize that um, this particular uh, draft in progress that we're talking about is uh, very much exploring a range of options. Mm -hmm. I, I don't necessarily endorse all of them or think that anybody has to or needs to endorse all four. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of my work is exploratory in trying to show um, how you might develop a model for explaining things in theistic terms and what the, the kind of virtues of different approaches like that might be. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really useful. It's, it's certainly modest in a good way, too. Um, and, you know, the, models are sometimes all you really need, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you already have good motivation to, you know, endorse a particular position, but there's a tension, uh, models are all you really need to kind of alleviate right. the tension, right? You don't need a definitive answer. And I think in that sense, it's, it's really useful. So Dr. Pierce, before we wrap this one up, um, please, uh, remind us of the, the book that you have out. I guess that's still your most recent published book, right? So I want to make sure we get some attention to that. It's a debate book with, uh, Dr. Oppie. Maybe you could remind us of everything in that book and where people can get a copy and then tease, tease some future projects. What are you working on next after that? Yeah. So the, um, most recent book is Is There a God? A Debate with Graham Oppie. And um, it's uh, available from Routledge or, or from uh, Amazon or wherever else you like to buy your books. Um, I present this uh, argument from contingency for the existence of God, as well as an argument from religious experience. And we have a couple of rounds of back and forth on um, the questions of kind of methodology and worldview construction and how to go about comparing theistic and naturalistic worldviews. Um, in, uh, in a more scholarly uh, vein, my current big project is about the religious context of the philosophy of George Barclay. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty big long-term uh, project, but I'm looking at kind of philosophical content of 17th and 18th century Anglican sermons and polemical writings and, and the way in which Barclay is uh, entering into those kind of specific religious debates. And as I've been doing that project, I've been finding that it, it has uh, important relevance for some of the issues we've been discussing here, including questions about analogy and the divine attributes, um, as well as a lot of other related issues. Great. Cannot wait uh, for those projects to uh, to come out whenever they, they come out. Uh, in the meantime, I'd love to bug you again later about maybe coming on in the future once the semester winds down and talk about uh and actually the argument from religious experience i think would be a mm. fun one to explore as well but you've got a lot of different irons in the fire i know so lots of lots of great content but uh until then uh thank uh i want to thank everyone for tuning in if you guys enjoy this content please like and, and comment and your thoughts and, and share the episode and i want to thank you dr pierce this has been a really uh stimulating and and uh, I, th I think productive conversations thanks so much for taking the time to be here really appreciate it yeah thank you for having me on